Okay, so we're going to try to replicate what Julia provided in excellent instruction with the fancy muscle pants and a review for you for the muscles. Um, and so I have a few uh, things that I've brought in. So I brought in a stool today, a little short stool, and then I also have a book to use um, as supplemental aids if you want to kind of follow along or try to do these movements with me. So I'm going to stand up. <clears throat> we have the fabulous muscle tights on. And so we're going to work through things a little bit differently from what Julia did. So we're going to start with the adductor longus. Sorry, we're going to start with tensor fascia lateral. We're going to start with our hip flexors. So recall that you have a hip flexor here. This is the tensor fascia lateral, so it's a relatively short muscle. And it's going to come from the pelvis, and it's going to connect down into the iliotibial band, which is going to go down to the knee, okay? And so as you go through that, um, this is going to be one of our external hip flexors. You may remember that we also have deep inside the hip, the iliopsoas. And as a reminder for the iliopsoas, Looking at the pelvis here, that's two muscles that form the iliopsoas. So the iliacus actually comes off of the ilium and rides across the pelvis here. And the psoas muscle actually connects to these lumbar vertebrae. And they fuse together and they actually come across the front of the hip and they connect down at the femur. And so when you're using hip, hip flexing muscles, the goal of these muscles is going to be to actually elevate um, or flex the thigh, to flex the femur, okay? So tensor fascia lata on your left, tensor fascia lata on your right, in combination with the iliopsoas are going to help flex the thigh towards the hip, okay? Um, now, as Julia mentioned, that the muscles can shorten if we're sitting for a long time period. And so one of the things that you can do to sort of stretch your hip flexors is going to involve your back. And so to stretch the hip flexor, what we want to do is rotate the pelvis. OK, and so as we're sitting a lot, um, our leg is close to our hip. And so these hip flexors get shortened when this happens. So as we extend the thigh and straighten the thigh to anatomical position, so as I straighten the thigh to anatomical position, that's then going to pull on the tensor fascia lata and on the iliopsoas muscle in my hip. So one of the things that I can do to stretch that muscle, right, so stretching the muscle is trying to elongate it, so it's pulling the origin or proximal attachment and the insertion, which is the distal attachment, and we're pulling those apart. So one of the things that I can do that is to focus on actually curving my spine. But as I curve my spine, I'm also going to take my leg and I'm going to put my leg behind me as if I was in a semi lunge position. So from the distance, it might look like this. And then up close, because we're focusing on the hip, it's going to look like this. So this leg is extended, my right leg extended behind. And so as you stand there, if you're... If your muscle's short, you may actually find that your torso wants to tilt towards the anterior, almost like you were going to bend down and touch your toes and come back up. So in order to get some stretch on this muscle, the tensor fascia lata and the iliopsoas, those hip flexors, when my leg behind me, I want to focus on almost sort of dropping, driving my pelvis forward and driving and pulling this stretch along the length of the body. You can even reach your arms up to sort of elongate that stretch and in involve some of your abdominal muscles as well. And so if you hold this position for a while, you should begin to feel a stretch through the hip. So you're gonna make sure that your pelvis isn't tipped forward, your iliac crests and the ilium isn't gonna be bent forward because if we bend forward, we're taking away that stretch on the tensor fascia lata, and on the iliopsoas. So we want to think about holding our torso upright, driving the pelvis sort of forward a little bit into a soft stretch to stretch those hip flexor muscles. 
and then repeat on the opposite side so you can make sure that you don't have anatomical variation. You're not missing one of these muscle groups, so your hip flexors are stretching in this fashion. Now, another way that you can work um, your hip flexors would be in climbing. And so if you're going upstairs, so to bring your leg up, you're going to have to bring your leg up. But then that's also going to engage the rear muscles. So remember, we have the gluteus maximus muscle. It's also attached at the pelvis. And it has this big white band of material that comes together and forms the iliotibial tract that runs down past your knee that combines its insertion point with the tensor fascia lata. So glutes max and tensor fascia lata working together here. And so in order to work the glutes, you may remember we said you have to run, you have to do something that forces the leg to pull. So what the glutes are going to do is they're going to help uh, extend the leg to get the leg in the anatomical position. So here, my hip flexors work to get my foot up to the stool. To get my glutes to work then, I engage the glutes to extend the leg as well as the hamstrings so that I can stand upright. So you can use a stepping motion to help engage the glutes. And if you do this, put your hands on your glutes, on your derriere, and feel that muscle contraction. You may be able to feel those muscles tense as you step up. Okay, so to do this, you would need some sort of step to do this particular um, motion. So since we're talking about the glutes and we're also talking about stepping, let's talk about the hamstrings. And the hamstrings have the proximal aspect of the muscle group, and they also have the distal end of the muscle group. So as we look at the hamstrings, the outer lateral group is the biceps femoris. It has two heads. And then the medial group is the semimembranosus. And then there's a little muscle peeking out behind the semimembranosus that is the semitendinosus. So in these muscle groups, some of what they're going to do is work along your knee. They're going to stabilize the knee, so the biceps femoris is actually stabilizing the knee on the lateral side on the posterior, and the semimembranosus and semitendinosus are helping stabilize the knee on the lateral side of the muscle group here. Okay, so to do a hamstring stretch, um, we need to figure out how to pull those muscles apart. Okay, so when we're talking about these muscles, we talk about their action, right? So like hip flexors flex the hip. To stretch that muscle, I need to separate the origin and insertion. And so I did that extension of the leg and dropping the pelvis forward. So for the hamstring, if I'm going to contract the hamstring, one of the things that the hamstring is going to do when I'm stepping up, it's going to pull on the proximal side of the muscle and help extend the leg, the thigh, extend the thigh into uh, a anatomical position. But the other thing that we have are the hamstrings as they attach to the lower leg. And so when the hamstrings contract at the lower leg, they're going to pull the tibia down. So they're going to actually create flexion of the lower leg. And if I was in anatomical position and I did this, and I contracted the muscle fibers down near the knee on the hamstring group, that's going to bring the knee up. Okay. And so if you do this, you may feel some tightening in your hamstrings. My hamstring is always tight. I always get muscle cramps almost the second I do that. I can do it with my left leg, and I don't experience that muscle cramp. So the exercise to work this lower end is to actually do a little kicking motion towards your hip to try to engage the distal end of the biceps femoris, of the semimembranosus, and the semitendinosus. Now, doing that sort of equally, you'd want to do that on both legs to engage the muscle. But unfortunately, as I'm engaging the muscle here, I always end up with some cramps in the back of my hamstring group here. Okay, So that's going to be to contract the muscle group. Your muscles are also going to work. Your hamstrings, in coordination with your glutes, will be working when you step up to extend the thigh. Okay? And so the glutes really get work if you're going up an incline, so moving your treadmill to an incline, 
or um, hiking on a hill that's really going to engage your glutes as well as your hamstrings and work these muscle groups hard as well as your hip flexors because your foot is going to land elevated compared to where the other foot is and then as you step up you're going to be engaging the proximal end of the hamstrings the biceps femoris semitendinosus and semimembranosus as well as in engaging the gluteus maximus muscle as well okay so that's how to contract the hamstring groups. We also want to consider how to stretch the hamstring groups. So in stretching, we want to take the proximal end origin and the distal end, the insertion, we need to take those apart from each other. So remember your hamstrings are connected down at your knees on the posterior side to the condyles of the tibia and to the head of the fibula. And they're also inserted um, up on the ischial tuberosity, up inside your pelvis. So to create and stretch on this muscle group, the goal is to tilt your pelvis so that your ischial tuberosities are elevating. And so to do that, remember you want to find where your hip flexors are. So put your hands where your hips line or, or, or bend. And you're going to want to focus on keeping your torso straight from where your hip flexors are. And you're going to lean your torso forward. Depending on how tight your hamstrings are, that will determine how far you go. So you're going to stretch your hamstrings until you feel them. But don't go too far because you can create muscle injuries by stretching too hard or too fast. My husband is a big fan of if a little is good, a lot is better. Don't do it. He's always getting injured, okay? So hands at the crease, torso straight with pelvis. You want to focus on tilting at the head of the femur and tilting your pelvis so that the ischial tuberosities are going to be extending towards the posterior, and that's going to put a pull on the hamstring. And so you should feel a sensation along the back of your leg, um, you want your knees reasonably straight. Don't walk them hard towards the back, but don't let them buckle towards the front. Hold them in place, and you should feel that pull or that stretch of that hamstring group. So I have tight hamstrings. This is an exercise I should be doing daily to encourage those muscles to not be so aggravated and to decrease cramping in that muscle group. Okay, That's the posterior leg. Remember, on your anterior surface of your thigh, you have your big muscle, the rectus femoris, and then three muscles that sit underneath this big rectus femoris. So rectus femoris is the only one that attaches or originates at the pelvis. The others are going to originate near the greater trochanter um, on the proximal side of the femur. So these muscles are going to, to start at the femur where the rectus femoris starts at the pelvis, originates at the pelvis. And so we have vastus medialis that's on the inside, vastus lateralis that's on the outside. And if I was able to cut the rectus femoris and peel this muscle group back, we would have vastus intermedius in the center. So what these muscles are going to do, particularly the rectus femoris, because it crosses the hip, what this is going to allow is this big rectus femoris to assist in flexion of the hip with the tensor fascia lata and the iliopsoas that we started with. And so here you have this big rectus femoris muscle. And so when it contracts, it's going to help with or assist with the flexion of the thigh, the flexion of the femur. And then the hamstrings and the glutes are going to help with the extension of the thigh, the extension of the femur, okay? So at the proximal end, this muscle is contributing to flexion of thigh, and then reverse muscle groups are helping extend the thigh. Now recall that your thigh muscles, all of the vastus groups, vastus lateralis, medialis, and intermedius, in combination with the rectus femoris, all insert at the patellar tendon. So you have a tendon that comes down to the patella in your knee. And so when these muscles contract and we engage the lower aspect of this muscle group, 
The goal is to pull on the lower leg, or what you'll find in the book is referenced that the lower leg is called the leg, and this region is called the thigh or the femur. So when our quads work to flex or to contract here, and they flex at the hip, they're also going to contribute in extension of the lower leg, okay? So when I, oh, I had a great grandma, um, great grandma Alice, and she was a crack. She was like a pistol, okay? And she was put in a nursing home because she had some health issues. And she was sitting there, and there was a particular nurse that she really didn't like, and he was not particularly kind to her. He wouldn't let her get away with anything. So one day somebody wheeled her up to the nurse's station. She was sitting there, and the nurse was talking right in front of her. And Grandma Alice is sitting there in her wheelchair. And the nurse bends over, and Grandma Alice engaged her quadricep muscles, and wham, she kicked him and knocked him over. So to get that kick of the lower leg, I have to contract vastus lateralis, medialis, intermedius, and the quads to get that extension of the lower leg, okay? So that's how we're going to contract this muscle group, okay? Um, to extend this muscle group, uh, to stretch this muscle group, I have to pull the origins and the insertions apart again. And so if I want to apply a pull on the front of my uh, muscle here, um, you can actually get some pull back in that lunge that we were doing that helped with the hip flexors. So that's actually going to pull. And if you, if you lean back, extend your back, you may feel some pull down that muscle. But perhaps the easiest way to get these quads to stretch, to pull the origin and the insertion apart from each other, is to simply reach down and grab your ankle and rotate your leg so that you're holding your ankle on the posterior, and that's going to pull on the thigh. It's a really nice, comfortable stretch there, okay? So that's another nice stretch activity, and you, of course, would want to do it on the opposite leg as well in order to get that same sort of sensation. Try not to have your knees out to the side. That alters the stretch. So you want your thigh in anatomical position, and you just want to flex the knee, bringing your heel as close to your gluteus maximus as possible without overly stretching the muscle, and then gently drop your leg back down. Set it back down. Don't allow it to just fall. So that's going to stretch the muscles here. So now we've looked at the muscles of the upper leg. Now it's perhaps time to consider stretching the muscles of the lower leg. And so to look at your lower leg and the musculature of your lower leg, um, there's sort of a twofold aspect to it. So I'm going to bring my knee up here. Hopefully you guys can see this. So for the lower leg, we're studying two primary muscles on the anterior. And so you're going to find the shin of your bone. You can palpate this with your finger and find that bony process. This is where our shin splints happen a lot. And if we move our hand to the lateral side, we should be able to find a big meaty muscle called the tibialis anterior. It's going to start lateral. And it's actually the tendon is going to cross across the top of the foot and connect to the first metatarsal and the medial cuneiform on the inside of your arch. Now there's a couple of fibularis muscles, and the fibularis muscle that we're gonna focus on is fibularis longus. So there's fibularis longus because it's a long muscle, and there's a brevis, it's a shorter muscle. Fibularis longus is gonna come over on the lateral side, it's gonna come down by the lateral malleolus, and it's gonna wrap around underneath the foot. And it is also going to attach to the first metatarsal and the medial cuneiform. And so what this does is provide some stabilization. So if you're thinking about your anterior right now, you could try to stand on one foot and balance on one foot. If you find yourself wobbling back and forth, if your foot is improperly balanced and you're struggling to balance on one foot, your tibialis anterior is pulling on the medial side of your foot 
And then the fibularis longus is attaching on the opposite side, on the, the lateral side of the foot, and trying to help stabilize and balance you. So if you want to feel these muscles kind of working against each other, try to balance on one foot. I'm super good at balancing on my right foot. I struggle a little more on my left foot as my tibialis anterior and my fibularis longer. I'm sort of struggling for, um, for control there. Now, the tibialis anterior, one of the motions of the tibialis anterior is to do a movement that we call dorsiflexion. So this comes out of Chapter 9. And so the goal with dorsiflexion, so as the tibialis anterior contracts, as the tibialis con anterior contracts, is to bring the toe towards the knee. So to walk sort of flat-footed. And so if you sit here and you do, actually right now I'm doing a leg extension, and even if I lean forward into that leg extension, I can actually get my hamstring groups to contract. But I also can do this to get the tibialis anterior stretched right through in here, okay? Because this is, um, or this is contracting that tibialis anterior muscle group. Okay. Now, if I engage fibularis longus, which is going under that lateral cuneiform and underneath the foot to the medial cuneiform and the first metatarsal, so past lateral malleolus under the foot, when that contracts, it works with the posterior leg muscles to plantar flex. And so to plantar flex, you're going to pull. Now, if you do a plantar flex right now, if you point your toes, you may find a burning sensation right here because you're pulling or stretching on the tibialis anterior. And when you contract your tibialis anterior, it's going to provide a pull and you might find that you feel the fibularis longus contracting there. Okay. Um, so people who have plantar fasciitis, so issues with the sole of their foot, are frequently going to put themselves in a dorsiflexion position contracting the tibialis anterior to try to help the connective tissue on the back of the leg to relax, okay? And recall right here is the retinaculum, and that's holding those tendons down to give you your nice dainty ankles or your nice dainty wrists. You have retinaculum in your wrist as well. So the last muscles to consider, let's see if we can do this in a way that you can see it. So I'm going to stand on the stool so that you can see the muscles at the back of the calf. And so on the back of the calf, we have the gastrocnemius, and then underneath, underneath the tendon is the soleus muscle. And so you can see the soleus muscle peaking right here, okay? And so these two are going to sit, gastrocnemius is superficial and soleus muscle is deep. They also are going to work to draw on the calcaneus and draw the calcaneus towards the knee. So it's going to help elevate us, okay? So if I want to con contract my gastrocnemius, my soleus, and my fibularis longus, even though the fibularis longus is attaching at a different site, it's going to help me to plantar contract my lower limb. And so to exercise this limb, you can repeat this motion going down and up. Now, in some of my physical therapy that I was doing recently, I was told to do this at the end of a stair tread so that I could also drop my heels down a little further. So if you're able to drop your heel down lower than this tread, that's going to stretch the gastrocnemius and stretch the soleus, and then I can come up and elevate, contract, and then drop below the step to stretch that muscle group. Another way to stretch this particular muscle group is to put your foot flat on the ground and to either lunge forward or you can even put your toe against the wall and kind of lean into the wall. So as you're leaning forward here with a straight knee, the gastrocnemius, which is attached towards the proximal side of the knee, will start to burn. And so you should feel a sensation here in your gastrocnemius. Heel should be on the floor. And as you lean into that, you also could work on your hip flexors and give a nice stretch to the hip flexors at the same time that your gastrocnemius is getting a, a, a flex. Now, the gastrocnemius is bearing most of the work when your knee is straight. So to engage the soleus, simply 
cock your knee. Drop your knee a little bit with your heel still as close to the floor as possible and gently sink into that stretch. And you should be able to feel the soleus. So the sensation that you're getting should be towards the middle of the calf, the middle of the lower leg, and lower down, even towards into the ankle. Okay, so that would be mechanisms to contract and then also stretch the gastrocnemius. Plantar fasciitis, which is a condition that I've suffered from for over five years, comes when your connective tissue is too tight. So that connective tissue on the back of the leg wraps underneath the foot. And so one of the things that happens is that in night, if we sleep with our toes plantar flexed, so if I'm sleeping, with my toes in a plantar flexion, then what's going to happen with my toes is that this connective tissue as it goes through its healing is going to heal with the connective tissue shortened. And then as soon as I step down in the morning, I put my heel on the ground and I move my foot to a dorsiflex position, it's going to pull on all of that connective tissue and create new tears through that connective tissue. So some people with plantar fasciitis sleep in a boot that keeps their foot in a dorsiflex position. So as the healing that occurs at night does happen, the connective tissue is already stretched. Another nifty trick in the morning before you get up is to do some tibialis anterior contraction, gastrocnemia soleus contraction, and plantar flex, and then gently dorsiflex, and stretch that connective tissue out until you can get your foot into a fully dorsiflexed position. And that helps gently stretch the tissue and doesn't destroy as many of the healing spots in that damaged connective tissue. So this hopefully gives you yet another way to think about um, these muscles and their origin and insertions to think about how we're getting them to contract and relax. Maybe something to pay attention to is that the muscles of the thigh oftentimes have actions on the hip and also have ha actions below the knee. So any action that occurs at the hip is going to alter the thigh or the femur. So flexion would be bringing the thigh towards the anterior and extension would be back to anatomical position or even extending to the posterior. So remember, you also can do kind of a leg lift to that posterior. And if you're doing a posterior leg lift, you're working on your hamstring group right up next to your derriere. If I'm considering the contractions and the motions of muscles on the thigh, crossing the knee and impacting the tissues at the knee and the bones on the tibia and the fibula. When I get flexion at that joint, the flexion at the joint for the tibia, flexion is actually going to be to bring the lower leg towards the derriere out of anatomical position. And when the quads contract, we're going to extend the lower leg and bring the lower leg back into anatomical position. Okay, so just another something to kind of be paying attention to as you study these muscles. And hopefully this gives you a quick studying of the muscles as you are preparing for your next weekly quiz.